All right, y'all, the lumber has arrived. Thankfully, the students moved it in to the stage for me. I got my meat and potato tools, the stuff that I'll always need for the most part, sort of set up here, broken out. And if it's less likely, it's underneath. And if it's really unlikely, it's still in the box or the bag, right? Um, circular saw, saw saw, jiggy, bread and butter, oscillating tools. I've got a couple because sometimes you end up with constantly wanting one of the other blades so it's um you know you know that methodology right all the different screw driving guns um some big boy impact uh drivers some smaller ones when it's less important that we have all kinds of cojones the screw driving gun for drywall so that i can put up the uh, underlayment or luon plywood on our for skinning which are like full-blown uh older uh, full-blown drill with a three-jaw chuck on it these two little uh three-jaw chuck drills for making holes the heavier right angle drill and the big mammer jammer is down here uh if we need him which we almost always uh, or almost never do unless you have a couple big hole saw sizes that i'm using interchangeably sometimes that happens so all the different hole saws all the different uh grinding discs and flap and sanding discs oh the palm sanders in here too hiding out i don't try to publicize this stuff if I can help it, all my screwdriving tips, oscillating tool, cutters, um, spade bits for smaller diameter, uh, large diameter holes, but of the smaller variety, uh, the router uh, cutters, and the trim router in there, charger, batteries, fans, lights, first aid kit. <laughs> some uh, hand tools in the hand tool bag, which doesn't necessarily need to come out just yet. And uh, we're gonna make use of the flat area of the stage. I got a bit of a workshop table on this side, because the thing is they gotta get out here after the school day most days. And the full cast for this show, particularly for Matilda, lots and lots of kids, kids from middle and even elementary school, I think in a couple cases. So it's just a big thing. And so I gotta get out and set up build something and then get it up and off of here in the next few hours so that they can do their rehearsal. Um, we're going to start with the big rolling wormwood one side slash crunch em hall other side set piece. It's very similar to what I built for Adam's family. It's a modification. And, um, you know, if I sell those prints down the road, there's your opportunity to stop the frame and get some rudimentary dimensions. But we're going to build these walls. Uh, I need two of those and then two ends. And if I can get uh, those constructed and set aside today, that'll be great. If there's a chance I could put all four pieces together, that's even better. But we'll have to see what, what happens. Um, I could shoot these all together with nails and that would go a lot more quickly. And it, But the thing is, it's just better off being built with screws for, for a lot of reasons. So... Um, we'll just see what occurs here. And what was the last thing I wanted to mention? Um, I think we got the stringers for this upper set of stairs left over from last year. So I was careful to maintain this dimension here. And this thing grew a bit wider because this was one half of a double door for Adams. Cause we did two of these pieces, mirror image and the pair of double doors that roll would fit in there. This time we're going to park the single rolling door in there. And I want it to work out flush with the end of the set piece. So that changed this dimension to change this here too, weirdly which I would have thought that they were the same height. But there must be something different about it that I'm not remembering. Because uh, this is the one we will be using. But I think, I thought that the, I would have sworn the double wide door was just this thing, but wider. And so its overall height would have been the same. But there must be some discrepancy because I had to change this set to accommodate this door. And I'll just be sure of that when I get to it. But we'll start by bas basically making all the pieces of the frame I got one 10 footer to cover this lower plate and the rest of them will be built from eight foot pieces. And then we'll make all these unique uh, parallelogram, uh, you know, uh, components that have an angle on one end. I guess it's just one, two, three, four. And that one actually comes in close, but no cigar. It's not gonna land totally on this upper piece. It's gonna hang up. There's gonna be a gap there, which is fine. Um, as a, as a a factor of maintaining a 16 inch layout but in elongating this i could have repopulated uh, the 16 inch on center layout from this end where we catch it up and could, maybe if i started here and went that way we would have been better off with the layout and stuff but it's not the end of the world um and it's just so handy to 
um, mechanically com construct these things by just making all the pieces as the computer tells you to, and then you can trust that it'll be um, usable when you're all done. If you start playing jazz at this stage, you get yourself into trouble. So let's go ahead and make all these pieces twice. I know now that I'm going to have to open this up on one side and make more of a window opening underneath the stairway here so that we have a clear way in which to manipulate the magical chalk on the chalkboard that's going to be on one side. We can't be using a magnet on the back side to, to try and make the chalk right when there's studs in the way that we're heading into. But I am not going to lay out the opening in this construction when I make it and all of that because um, we don't know what the chalkboard's going to be yet, how big it's going to be, where exactly it's going to be located, and it will be no issue when we know for me to cut three or four of these off above and below head them off above and below, take the pieces out that we don't need for right now, set them aside, and we'll have what we need, and it'll just be the way that we choose to work. So sometimes you know that you're gonna make a change like that later, sometimes you make the, the geometry now, sometimes you make it later. But today we wanna make big progress and get in and get out where we use the floor, but get off of it. So as a component of that, let's get started. All right, well, I got enough components here to put both frames together. I got the one attached at all the corners now, except for over here. And you can see, you know, we know things like we know that these fit inside of there and that this is a flush outside corner and so is that, so we can do that. We know that sits on top of here, like usual, and it's a flush outside corner. We know that this is the distance. These blocks are all the same. These are two flush outside corners. And then if I made an extra one, I don't show it in the drawing, but if I made another one of those and stacked it here, made it flush with the end of this longer stick, and then set this piece to it, we know that's how that has to be. Now where this belongs up and down, this whole assembly is variable right now. And we've got some twisting that's happening. You can see that sits up a little bit. 
you know? And this is the thing that people think that they can get out of it, um, out of a construction like this by selecting the right piece, and that's a bad. Now there are pieces beyond this that you're really working uphill um, to install them there if you have a real bad problem. Now this isn't too much of a problem at this point in the project because I know that these two components will be offset from one another by those other short walls and those short walls will be equal distant in terms of width. And when you start getting those things all screwed together, you're gonna to start forcing this thing to behave. And we're gonna be able to force it to behave in this, in this way here as well. We'll be able to twist that back out of it. So you'll see when, don't forget that, and I'll show you where we get rid of that. Now, where to go with this on there? And it looks, you know, wildly out of square. A lot of that's an illusion to do with this, you know, piece. And so, essentially, this surface, this crevasse, needs to be the same, you know, the length of this piece here. We just need to pull that length to make a pencil line here. And then make sure that we're on that pencil line with that crack when we attach those. Then we're in good shape. Everybody has been attached where he needs to be. Would it be racked, potentially, that way? Uh, to where um, all the ostensibly 90 degree angles on one side of it are a bit open and they all the 90 degree angles on the other side are a bit closed. Yeah, and they all have to get to 90 degrees. So we can continue to make attachment points at the right locations. And then another thing that we can do is make all the pieces with an angled side on them. And then I can start and put the layout on this lower plate and put everybody at 16 inches on center as per the drawing. And then all the bottoms of those will be attached correctly. And then we can start to rack this thing around and uh, measure over from this long component if we're at 16 inches on center to that first one that has an angled side. And then we're 16 inches on center to the next one. And uh, we find where he should land and then we wrestle this thing as we add the last few pieces that have the angle cut on them and make them attach to this piece where they should. Then we uh, at the very least should be very close and the only thing left is a little bit of racking which will come out of this thing when we put plywood on it for the you know when we finally put plywood on it which uh, you could do when it's lying down but I will likely do it when it's standing up because the thing about it being I want to get it up first as quick as possible up on wheels as quick as possible and the plywood that we use hangs long to obscure the wheels, and so it makes just a flimsy skirt across the bottom. And two things, that is insubstantial, and this whole thing won't stand up on that. Um, and so if you put the wheels on and then get that to a point and then try to tip this thing up and the wheels are sliding all around and you're breaking the plywood, that's the wrong order. And secondly, that plywood, I like to stop half an inch off the surface of the floor here. So all the time when we're rolling around, it appears to glide. You can't see underneath there, but it's a good amount off the floor. So it's not getting caught on any of the hardware and lumps and bumps that we've got out here, right? So first we frame it, then we get the frame um, wheels on, and then we get the frame up and rolling. And then we put some half inch plywood scraps on the floor and start the uh, Luan sheets standing on the plywood on the floor to preserve that gap. And then we rack the construction around until the ice, nice factory square edges of the plywood are nice and flush with the verticals on this uh, framing. And we put some pieces on and we continue to chase down that plumb level and square quality in the right order. Okay, so that's what you'll see me do. But for now, we'll continue to put these things together where we know that they've got to go. We make the pieces the right length as per the design. We make the attachments in the right location. And we just keep putting things where they belong, rooting out any issues. Sometimes I, I find an issue uh, that I you know made an error or something else. But usually if we start with the computer in the real world space of the computer, then the real world, real world, uh, it will work there too. And that's, you know, knowing these angles and knowing the exact length of this piece from the longer point there to the longer point there. And and everything then just putting them together tightly. Um, when we get all done here, the angle that we need on that will work out with the stringer that was made the first time I made this. That'll be a true test. Um, I've modified the drawings, but I've preserved the angle and the length here to the best of my ability. I do have the lumber in order to make new stringers if it becomes necessary, because despite all my checking, sometimes it happens and I don't want to miss a beat. But if we don't need those pieces, we'll take those back. We'll be certainly going back to, for a few more pieces of lumber. We've got some pieces of junk lumber that should be returned when we do that to get other stuff that's better. And so if we've got to take that back because we didn't end up making stringers, uh, so much the better. And if we need it because we can't make the old stringers work, well, then we've got it. And we can just keep moving because it won't be worth going backwards and undoing any of this. And um, I've made this what it needs to be, all things all other things considered and I tried really hard to use those stringers and if they don't work for us they don't work you know so it's all about concessions all right back to work
Okay, that's all the components necessary. Now I waffled here and I see what the biggest problem was, was I came down and had, see these are all called out as 16 inches on center or to the left hand side of these sticks, starting here, because it makes it handy to lie. You always try to go with a horizontal application of a four by eight sheet with respect to the direction of the, uh, of the stud. So, either starting lower right hand or lower left hand would have been handy. In this case, uh, it would have obviously been started over there and played out in this direction. Um, but I started here and filled to there. But here, I didn't assign any dimensions and I can see visually this one's bigger. And so then on the floor, I didn't really reference that and I started looking at well the little pieces here, which means the layout starts at this end and goes that way. So then I went this way and this is actually the opening. It's obviously the first part of the wall. It isn't actually a layout stud, I thought. Well, it turns out that it was a layout stud. So I've got this one incorrect and then you saw me sand off the marks. Uh, I'm on the new correct marks with all these sticks that are a certain length with an angle on them. And then we're on that one there too. And then these two are on the old incorrect layout. So we gotta go left with those two i got to go left with this one. That's going to have to change at the top. There's a bunch of different things here that come into play because if I, I really don't have trouble squaring something like this at this lower corner, up there at the opening for the doorways where you want things to be completely square. So if by the time you get up there, if you're worried about the layout and you're putting big sheets on here and you have a little scrap of plywood necessary up here, you don't have the leverage necessarily to square this where if you had started there and the full sheet came down into this area, even though you notched it for the opening, well, all this reference surface here when it's attached correctly, I can use that to force this where I want it to live. And so, how I skin this is based on where I need the most control, and then how I skin it is based on where the layout starts and stops, kind of. And uh, oh, I could certainly start here and go that way and then make a little piece here. I just wanted to get away from little weird pieces if I can help it, because they tend to stand out, because you can see the whole thing more easily uh, when it's all in one color and it's just obviously a big patch on the wall. So again, that's another factor you want to maintain. I'm going to make a decision here, one way or another. I'm not even prepared yet. Um, such a simple thing to knock it out, make pairs of pieces and th throw them together on the floor, designing it in the computer, it should go really quickly. But I've been in and out of this now for several hours, for over several days, just because I've got to pick up this scenario, put it back together. I had wanted to get the vacuum set up and attached to the saw, but I can't have the saw where I wanted because there's not an uh, outlet close enough because I like to run the vacuum. Now that I'm set up with a vacuum switch when we're running the saw, which I realize now I probably failed to remember to do,
Okay, we made it to the weekend. Maybe we can get some real work done now. Yesterday, I got that thing up and rolling. And this is Wormwood, um, essentially, my idea thus far. And this is potentially going to change quite a bit. Um, the lower stairs would come down at us like this. And uh, the roof on the house is going to come, you know, up across the end like that to a peak. I'm going to probably put a wall on this here, pushing this door in the house back into an alcove. But on this wall, I'm going to see if I can't make myself enough room to frame a window so that it's got like siding. However, the outside of the house is finished. I don't know if it's brick or whatever and a window. And then the roof comes at you and then there's a dormer and a window at the end of the dormer. And that's Matilda's little attic space is a dormer area under the roof angle at the top of the stairs. And then the stairs go up and turn and go up again. And her father can walk all the way up practically to the top of the stairs because the peak of the roof is about here. So not that we necessarily will end up with that action up there, but I wanted to give people the ability to go all the way. And Matilda can go all the way up and hopefully sit in the window at the end and hang her feet out on the roof, potentially. Um, but I would also like to try something this year that I've had in my head since I started putting this set on wheels, which of course is first and foremost so that we can do scene changes. But I always kind of wanted to see the set choreography with the lights up. Uh, you know, which is to say to move and to change the scene subtly without seeing any crew or anything like that. And so since I've got the house set kind of pointed this way right now, I thought, you know, if Matilda goes up and then it becomes a scene of about her specifically, then the whole set could turn and feature her outer window uh, or at the window underneath the stairs or the exterior of the house and then turn away from us and basically waffle back and forth potentially. Um, and I hope to do some footage of the show this year, at least, um, time lapse of some scenes and scene changes. Just, it's not really that important that you see or hear the performance necessarily as far as these videos and stuff go. So it was a daunting idea before to do live action real time and then try to get and process that all out. But if I just set up time lapse in the house here, maybe we'll get that. And so... Some other considerations now, technical considerations. If you're going to year, if you are going to um, park this other set piece underneath there, we, well, we're going to, we can't see up in here. We're going to put Luan on that bottom surface of the set to create essentially a ceiling because people are at a low angle here and they can see up and you just want that to be a smooth surface. Which means that building this geometry so that this existing set uh, fits under it almost perfectly well then you see when you have a bump in the floor if I just pick up on that she'll go yeah see so it's the exact right dimension and overall height well that's good if we want to attach this piece to that because we're not pulling it out of square when we close a big gap but if you're going to roll them together and apart and, and change things around which we haven't decided what, which way we're going to go then you have to have more height even with that Luan surface, you really want to have an actual quarter inch uh, difference in the overall height of this. And so I would have to take half an inch out of all these short sticks and set this all back together again so that when I add a quarter inch Luan, I still have a quarter inch of clearance. So I got to think about, I had been thinking we'd attach this permanently. And when you, if you know, that's how I'd like to start. And if I get all that done and they say, well, can we make it separate? Then we really got a project. Um, alter alternatively, if I were to make it all so that those are all shorter and it flies underneath there and it can be separate, there'll be a gap that I suppose could be taped because I can get a hold of it and attach it in other ways. And we just have to tape the gap. So these are things that I want to think about now and try to hedge a bet, save myself the effort. Um, alternatively, you could tip it all over and just throw a quarter inch shim between the plywood wheel plates and the framing or anywhere there underneath the wheels. And, I would elect to leave that alone and just make those changes here. That's the thing. They're easy to make now, but they're going to grow more difficult to make as we move forward here now today. This lower set of stairs has been constructed and saved, and it's in the basement. It's going to get up here next week, so I'm not all that worried about um, 
you know, obviously I'm not going to make it, but it will add all of a sudden a lot to the set to have the finished set of lower stairs. I think today I'm going to try to put together the landings for at least the lower and possibly the upper and continue to hunt for the stringers. But I guess we didn't keep the stairs together and they'd be too narrow because I stretched this from three feet to four feet this year so that there was more of a ability to have a dormer and stuff on top. It wasn't so squeezed. So this is still 36 because the stairs, the lower set were 36 as well as the uppers when we first built this for Adam's family. You can go back and see that in my Adam's family set build. And um, I could have sworn we kept the stringers. And if we didn't keep the stairs together, that's fine. Cause like I was about to say, the treads will have to be remade at the very least to be 48 inches or 40, 49 inches so that there's a bull nose or a hangover, an overhang. Anyway, it's all very esoteric and boring. Let's uh, get to Okay, so here's the thing, because we're working with that pre-existing door, which is a huge bonus, but there are some features about it that we have to fold into our problem solving, right? One of the things with this piece, like when I built it for Adams, I built it three feet wide and about as thin basically as it could be, and I weighted it all down as a result, and we really didn't go up it or put anybody on it unless the lower stairs that went down in this direction were attached to it. But, and that gave it a nice big heavy footprint. But when we wanted to move it out of our way, we disconnected the lower stair and slid it to upstage to the back and took that other stair that was three feet wide and tucked it in behind, and you end up only occupying a three foot or a little more swath of upstage as far back as you can go and then we could bring another drop in in front of it and since it's a major space uh, where action takes place in the show we want a nice big interesting set as much as possible but we want it to be able to be folded up and consolidated for the few times when we're not in that location which most shows have some other locations and part of the magic of the positive uh, appearance of a set for a lot of the other segments is being able to fold it all up and make it disappear for places that are an entirely different space. And uh, for the sake of being able to lose it, then you know you have so much more visual interest happening within the context of the show in its entirety, right? We don't have to deal with the same kind of physical bulk and forms from every, in every scene. And that's what elevates, I think, a musical above a play in a lot of cases. Um, not necessarily along those lines, but it's, it's often that case because there's so much going on with the set in a musical. So that being said, we do intend to keep the lower section of stairs se separate and to be able to slide this thing upstage and put it in against the psych, which is our white drop here, upon which we're gonna project a lot of different things this year. For the first time, we're using more and more projection. That project projector will fill the whole space of the psych. And we're gonna rely on that for some other special effects like I think the magical chalk on the board and some other stuff are gonna happen with projection or partly with projection, but do that as it may. We've got to send this thing to the back. Now, long story short, basically, it took forever. But because we're going to try and send this to the back, I'm setting the feet of this independently rolling door 
back flush to this edge. They have to stick out because there's one, two, three, four casters in here and by itself, that's how it stands up, see? But if I just needed a doorway here um, and I wanted it, the wall to be flush, I wouldn't have to deal with these feet sticking out, which when we slide this thing back, we lose a foot almost in terms of being able to pack it up tightly because of just those feet sticking out. So I slide it in here. Well, then we wanna put a window in the middle of this end wall and have it be something that within the context of the Wormwood house, this is the door. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the door maybe into the bathroom or to some other area of the house. And to have the window here, well, it's around the corner here, that won't work. Now we can make it smaller narrower to make enough of a wall return here but that still despite the fact that it moves it away from this wall takes it out of being on center here why does that matter to me because right above we're going to have a dormer roof coming at us like this with a window at the end of it and really it's ideal even if your dormer windows don't line up with your lower windows which sometimes happens in the scheme of a house you can fix that if a lot of other things are lined up but since we're just showing a first floor window and a second floor window i really want them to be lined up because it's oftentimes with like federal colonial cape cod and other well thought out smaller homes in particular salt box house type things um that stuff lines up. And as soon as you push this left or right and have that dormer up there, I think it shits up the appearance of this set to a significant degree. Um, another thing is this opening that I made is gonna fit that grid in. If worst case scenario, we wanna put that type of window in here. I think I plan to go around this with some two by two to make a, um, what appears to be sashes and then straight across the middle to you know maybe a pair of them offset or whatever to really do a nice job of making it look like a double, double hung window. I'm not sure um, for her to be able to come out the upper window at all, which is just a loose idea in my head. Uh, once you make it and get it away from the roof line and stuff, it becomes a pretty small opening. And if we're making it look like they're double hung windows, even if she was able to magically pretend to slide it open, cutting that opening in half is too small for her to really get out of. And if she can't sit in it and hang her feet out, I don't think it's worth turning the set toward the audience and her doing anything out that window up there, which is along the lines of one of the movies where she goes out on the roof. Maybe it's the musical movie, I'm not sure. But I was thinking first, we might be able to walk out and get out on the roof like that, but instead it just ended up as a dormer. And so I'm gambling here on how much we can make use of this end of the set or even have her in there in her like attic room, knocking this whole face off of the side of it. And it should be tall enough for her to be sitting towards the top of the stairs and crawl over in there. Maybe she'll just sit and dangle her feet here. But I don't want to put thereby, I don't want to put all too much work into building a dormer through the roof for just visual interest. Um, so we'll just have to see. I may take that in steps and we may end up with just a regular roof over here, which I think would be a shame, but it does help us from the side that's Crunchum Hall classroom. Okay. Because having the Wormwood's roof line and a dormer showing up over in this right-hand corner, kind of, we know it's the other side of that set piece. A lot of people can sometimes see uh, what you've done, especially if you see it in the dark, turn around or whatever else like that. Um, but I would like this side to have a slightly different silhouette. And there's, it's tough to do that because a lot of times you gotta pick one silhouette and on the other side, you gotta black areas of it out so that you get what you want against blacked out features that are still physical, and especially when you light a psych behind there or whatever, that ultimately is the silhouette whether you black it out or not. So we wanna get away from what looks like a house silhouette when we're at Crunchum Hall. I'm gonna be working to that end. And so, <clears throat> and so now, you know, what are my choices? Um, probably gonna have to slide that door out. There's uh, not gonna be any other way. I wanted enough of the outside of the house here, first floor, and so what? maybe put some shrubs here, two and a half dimensionally, so we don't have to be four or five feet wide like a real shrub or a box hedge, but something that alludes to that out here, and, and just a wall is kind of a bummer. Um, and I think, you know, there's, I don't know, there's something to be said for it just being a, a flat wall here. It could have a piece of artwork on it, um, or a mirror instead of a window hole. I just kind of like to have my cake and eat it too. I don't think it's going to kill us if these wheels stick out. Another thing here though is it does help me with more of a commercial type building for that doorway to be set into an even more significant opening and opening to get those shapes because it helps you feel, if I were to trim those, 
correctly it ends up feeling like the wall is thicker and altogether more like what it's supposed to be so it's hard to say what to do it's difficult to say what to do um we'll just have to see i'm not ready to really call it right now but these are the things that are on my mind that you want to think about you could certainly do all this exhaustive planning and 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 sketching and stuff but there's just for what i'm paid which isn't anything to sneeze at but sometimes we got to do a lot of figuring things out you know live in real life i set this stringer up from something else to see and it's the same step geometry so i may end up cutting what i need out of it but obviously i forgot it up there and then I had to fall, fall and break on the floor so that's always fun yeah i could make it just an interior wall <laughs> I think it loses interest like this becomes dark in here whereas if it had been a window and had window geometry in it then the psych being lit through it makes it interesting again uh you know there's a chance that i should figure out once i come in for the for the dormer and then come in again for the window it'll still be on center but it may be so narrow maybe the thing to do is to make this that width and if i were able to come in get away with four or five inches smaller so it's two feet wide now so if we went down to a 16 or an 18 inch window uh 16 inch window man that is narrow hilariously narrow uh i could always slide this out a little bit and try to meet in the middle but i'd have none of this flexibility if i if i had let this at, left this as designed at three feet wide as a set piece going to four actually it's 47 and that's another thing. I went to 47 wide overall so that when we put the stringer up and we put a stair tread on there and we want the stair tread to hang an inch over to give it the visual interest of a stair tread that's finished into a room like this with an open baluster and we want to make the treads, if we made this piece 48 inches wide, then you want to cut 2 by 10 or 2 by 12 which is an expensive piece of lumber. You're going to have to have it at 49 inches to overhang a 48 inch stringer or, you know, to overhang a 48-inch wide set piece. Then you got to go to 49. Well, if you buy an 8-footer and you go to 49 on one, you've only got 47 on the other, and it won't work for you. So you waste 47 inches off of each one and thereby double the lumber order just to get the stair treads made out of expensive lumber. So because we could get 8-footers, cut them in half to a little over 48 because the rough cut's a little long. So, But we can go to exactly 48, and if I stretch the set to 47... Then the 48-inch steps will hang over and give us a nice shadow line and make it altogether more interesting instead of being perfectly flush, which for all the time and effort spent building this thing would be uh, uh, value, production value left in the garbage can um, in making it flush. So if we start the fact that we want the steps to hang over, then we squeeze this to 47 for the lumber's sake, and then we only have that to work with to get a window of reasonable width in terms of aspect ratio centered in the wall because the dormer wants to be centered because the window on the dormer needs to be centered and the one needs to be centered on the other because that's the way most residential construction that was well thought out from the arrow this house is supposed to be would be and to stagger them would really monkey it up and then to use the door that was going to be a super good value to us to just start and run with it instead of framing and hanging a door jam and stuff into this set from scratch now we end up and wanting to move it up home why do we want to tuck it up and out of the way not only do we want to drop something in front of it and that one foot of difference could make the difference between bring, being able to bring the very next we got psych lights scrim and then we got a leg and it looks like the next opportunity is a bar right there and we could bring something in in front of this set uh and then if you have to stay away by a little bit of a foot, you may have to... The thing of it is, though, see, here's something else I should mention, is if you're trying to get it to pack up behind a bar and and having to come out a foot because of those feet on those on that door to get that to fall in front, you can squeeze it back and carefully push into the psych every time because it won't be being, be being used, right? We're going to be bringing in a backdrop in front of it. And so I guess the end of the end it's not the end of the world to have those stick out because it's not as though we're going to have to we would have to push into something that will otherwise be seen and have big you know wrinkles and stuff in it as a result if we're careful we can push in a little ways however i do like this little recess that it creates see this is my problem all the time well i guess you'll have to just stay tuned and see how i decide to do
Okay, this is the upper landing. And then I got started on the lower landing. But another thing that you, it's mind bending about this, if you are really into it, these are details that probably nobody else would care about. But uh, the way that you build with this type of lumber in the real world, um, you end up cladding it with appearance boards, three quarter inch lumber that's clear, no knots or whatever else. And you can have the seams and stuff go in the right orientation. However, in this case, I use a lot of the conventional style construction techniques, but like in the case of this window, this isn't how you make a window opening in a framed wall. It's really light missing pieces and whatever else, because we don't need the components to be correct like new construction in real life, uh, because the purposes of that are for rigidity and longevity and whatever else, the things that we don't need with this set, right? So there's that. Then there's the edge of this landing, the stair stringer that comes down, and then the front edge of this landing. Now the front edge of this landing is the front of a step. So I don't wanna see the end grain of the two ends for that square that we're gonna make. It's 35 by 47. So I want the front pieces to be 35 inches long and the size to be 44. So, uh, or yeah, whatever. Um, it needs to be total 47 and we need to lose three. Yeah, so 44 inch pieces. So the end grain of the front is here on this side uh, because we're not gonna clad that with anything. That's just more lumber and it's more whatever else, whatever, whatever. Now, the upper landing I've already made and the long side of that what did I do here? Did I cut them all the right length? So this is the thing. Things that you know you shouldn't do or that you know about and you're just not thinking. So this will either measure three inches too long. Yeah, three inches too, or yeah. So this should be 72. And we're at 75 and almost a half for some reason. Oh. So... <laughs> I added this wall to the design... So by design, from the point up there, from that point across the top is 72 inches to there. Then I wanted the landing to sit on top of this wall, so I added three and a half inches. Then I took three back off to account for the inch and a half here and the inch and a half there, so that this whole this thing is now correctly the right length. But the end grain will show, as you look at the side of it, even if we paint it, there'll be a little scene. It starts to become like, who cares? It's a set. But I want to keep track of that type of thing because the more practice I do here, the better off I am overall. So at this point, we've got the end grain showing on the upper, on the upper, yeah. Lots of ins and outs and what have yous. Um, and then it's like, what are we looking at? You know, the, the stair stringer finished exposed stairway to here. But then this is like, it's been cut out of the rest of the real house. And I expected to show then the framing. I wanted it to be kind of rough, like an unfinished attic where her bedroom is because nobody cares, right? She doesn't even get drywall. She doesn't get anything. Unfinished attic with stud walls on the far side and everything kind of unfinished and old construction, which would probably be cold and everything else. So uh, because I think when I did Adams, the stringer didn't sit flush with the framing and the, and the, and the Luan, I think it overhung by a little bit. And then the tread overhung the stringer itself because normally the finished stringer uh, exposed on a staircase is a little proud of the drywall and you want to have those types of things correct so you get the right shadow lines and things don't look weird. And so you've got nominal dimensions, you know, this is four feet wide, but you've got to be sure that you can put the quarter inch of Luan on that and then have the stringer not sit behind the Luan, which you don't want the top edge of the Luan to catch light and then have the stringer start. You want the stringer to overhang it. And then you want the nose of the stairs to overhang that. So I can make the stairs wider because it's just a factor of cutting, or no, scooting them out, and the treads can overhang three quarters of an inch or a half of an inch, and we'll still get the shadow line that we want. And I can still make the treads within, you know, two per eight foot long piece of lumber. But, and the upper landing, we're calling it, can be flush with the wall because then the 
Luan will stop there and it'll be exposed like it's the ceiling joist. Lots of questions here. You'll see more. What I'm, oh, like, what is supposed to look like finished space on this set? And what is supposed to look like unfinished construction space on this set? Where do those things, where's the line between them? And is it kind of like we literally hot knife sliced this cross-sectional piece out of the Wormwood house and, and walked away with it? That's what I kind of thought would be cool over here is to see the end of this stud in the wall and then what looks like, you know, plywood and then a dimensionally a full size three and a half inch brick and have a brick, whether it's really, you know, whether it's made and painted on or whatever, but look like real physical bricks and basically be the cross section of real construction, a dry, like basically drywall, a stud, some plywood. Usually there's an air gap, but I'd skip it for this case or just put a black, heavy black line there. And then a three and a half inch wide bricks and the appearance of bricks here, nice deep window casing with, you know, a fake jam and fake sashes and stuff. And then, you know, that would be kind of cool to see. And that's what I notice when people build sectional pieces of construction and they don't account for, account for the right thickness of the wall and the way that things would be put together. Um, it's not as though that is the star of this show whatsoever, but it lends credence to the whole set when an area that's mostly just, you know, it could just be finished about this big around, Luan, 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 painted like siding, painted like the inside wall, and then, you know, who knows what color to paint this or something else. There's choices to be made there. And I see set builders and other stuff, people build, make choices there. Where me, I think it's more fun when it looks like we sliced real construction. So that's my goal over here. Hopefully don't waste a bunch of time and effort and we don't, and it's for nothing. But it's also something that's been on my mind today in the way to butt and pass these corners, essentially. That's this 25 minute video. <laughs> this is a butt in and this is a pass. And where to butt and pass which ones. You also notice when I'm screwing them together, I'm doing kind of um, middle or high school style when you build a box like this and screwing straight through one straight through the pass and into the butt the problem with that is this is end grain in here here we're going through the side of all the grain and you know moving it out of our way and that really has a lot of strength to the joinery and here instead of going through the side of the grain we're going into the end grain and that's when you notice these things when you get out here and start moving them around or sometimes even the screw the thread strip before you even pull the head of the screw in because this isn't a very strong connection here what can you do about that you can go at an angle and so that's where you see me laying this on top of the wood just to get a sense of thereby where to start rather than starting the screw here I have to move the head of it out here and move down. And then I turn it to kind of be at the right angle. And then I end up screwing these pieces together like this or like this. And then you're going through the side of these grains and through the side of these grains and all the, uh, of the grain of this component and all of the threads really have a nice strong uh, attachment. The problem with starting out like this is when you pull at an angle like that, it can pull this out of flushness. So you see me start and put, uh, in this case, I did three before I changed my mind and decided to use this other method just for strength sake. So I didn't even put a third one in there, but on these sides, I went one, two, and then I came over here and I turned and you can see I went through like that. So I used the two straight on to pull it straight down and make it nice and flush, which is important. And then I can put one in at an angle like that and do it like this. Now, the other thing is, in real construction, since it's a two by eight, you'd have to have four fasteners overall in its overall height at every point you make a connection like this. So you'd actually have one more in here. And the thing is you could use the two outer corners straight and the two inners, one, you know, at an angle, the other. As long as you have some of those angle fasteners in like there, you have a much stronger corner than just going straight into the end grain. So don't, don't feel like you always have to uh, make the orientation of a fastener relevant to the, to the lumber at 90 degrees perfectly or anything else. It's the same as when I put this, you know, I put these pieces in. I don't necessarily drill, or excuse me, screw straight down into the end of them because not only, see, this is how much engagement you get an inch and a half when it's normal to the face. Uh, it's gonna be hard for me to show this. It's like right to there. But when you swing over to straight, this much more of the screw is consumed before the second piece is engaged. And so basically what I'm trying to say is you have far less threads into the second component 
because of the fact that we're trying to line up with it. And so, as well as that problem, you're going into the end grain again, and it's not that strong. Certainly not with fewer threads. Like this, this would be something that you could probably kick out if I had screwed those in like this. You could beat them with a hammer to the right, and it would, it would start trying to rip apart. You notice, alternatively, I put the screws in like this, like that. You see that? Now we're through the side of both of the grains, and in some cases, they tip out a little bit like that. You can come back and reorient it. I want to be aware of this for later. I can clip that off. And you can just babysit that, and you'll get better and better at it. But you want to be in there kind of like this. Even here, sometimes it's not real professional to see the screw come out much more than this. But a little bit, it's still a very strong connection as opposed to doing that. And you're just working with the volume of wood and the orientations of the grain and trying to find the most engagement and the, and the best angle of attack to the both components wood grain. And thereby you end up with a better structural connection. So blah, blah, blah. I guess I can go ahead. Oh, and then the piece, the icing on the goddamn cake is that I was thinking and rethinking, thinking and rethinking. Then I thought, no, I'll take the three inches off and I'll change the button pass for this other landing. So I made the mark, went over and double checked, came back and just started cutting where the saw was and never put myself on this mark. So at this point, I've, fair to say, I've undercut that piece. That piece I can probably get away with. So this will have to be used for something else. And now I'll have to get into another eight footer. Now they sent me this wildly long one. I got two more eight footers. Nothing's really great. Those heavy black marks in the grain are going to be uh, disconnected. Like it's not actually, those are like weirdly rotten crevices or otherwise. Um, it's not a great piece of lumber to start with. But they also sent me this extra long one because I assumed they owed me one more eight footer and didn't know that they could find it. But this broken 16 uh, had my eight footer and some more if they thought, you know, maybe I could make use of it. So I've got more two by eight than I probably ordered in this piece here. Not the end of the world, but around and around and around we go and this consumes time, but we want to get things right at this stage because these are the points in the fundamental foundational stages where we're picking this type of stuff out and really thinking it through. And then later, once we've made these commitments and we're happy with them, it starts to ramp up the speed with which we can finish things and put things together and commit to other stuff. goes more quickly as a result for having thought through what to do about this stuff right now. Okay, so back to you. Okay, so when you bring all these pieces together, if you aren't careful about the flushness of every single thing, you have to get that a little bit blended so that when we come back with the Luan, we can set everything without it being, having a hot spot of pressure underneath it or some tall, sticky, outy component kind of holding it out. So just kind of smoothing it. Now it's a little bit racked over and stuff. And what I'm thinking is, because I've got that half an inch of plywood underneath here. If I take it away, the framing and the pressure of it being out of square wants to put that a lot closer to the floor. So you can kind of see the gap. So that can be fixed uh, when we square this up and skin it. But I still think that if we're trying to move this and with the weight that we're gonna have just in the construction of the dormer and all of that, but with Matilda up there, if she's up there at all and we try to choreograph 
moving the set at all, the weight out here is going to close that gap. You're gonna end up wanting another wheel, but the wheel, the caster needs to be able to spin. And so in wanting this to look like regular construction wall and then brick, uh, the brick and the wall would both be on a foundation. And if there's no basement to this house, it would be on a slab. And so I could finish the end of this up a ways with what looks like solid concrete knee wall foundation, and then start what looks like the brick on the outside of that and go. And in the cavity of that double thickness, there might be enough room for a caster to swirl without brushing into the two sides in, in width. I can get away from the end as far as I need to go here so that it clears this way. But side to side, I gotta see, I forget, I've never made a, a reference for how far and wide the outside edge of those wheels spin around. I don't think it's too much. But then this corner of the wall will have to be reframed a little bit with a surface in there high enough to put the wheel on in the right spot so the wheel can carry the weight. But I think that's going to be for the best out here. And that will mean that, yes, indeed, we will make the wall wider. It'll look like real construction. I just don't want to lose a lot of time and effort there. I had thought, you know, what would be cool is to box that out, cover it with Luan finish, like concrete, whatever, and then make bricks by a two inch thick styrofoam and because bricks are about two inches tall, but make three and a half inch wide slices and cut them at whatever, I think they're eight, uh, seven or eight inches long and make styrofoam bricks. And then you'd stick them on the back with grout room enough for mortar, basically in between them all, stick them on and then you'd have to fill. So I was thinking you could use expanding foam or something, but expanding foam doesn't really, isn't controllable in between all of them. And then I started thinking, well, you could make it out of half inch thick and make um, like false brick half of an inch thick. And when you put that on, being in there half of an inch, that will look like mortar well enough to the audience having that relief or a quarter of an inch or three eighths of an inch, whatever, however thick we make them. But that would just mean that I need to bulk this up with Luan as well to be the surface of the mortar. And then we'll stick the fake bricks on. And we don't need all that many if we have a window, so here's the thing. We only need, I don't know, 20 square feet or something, which isn't all that many bricks to make. You could make it out of one sheet of foam and we could just ding them all up and sp I could spray them with my paint sprayer, a uh, really dark red and put them all up and then we can just dry brush with a lighter red and hit it, you know, I could take half a dozen of them away and just from far away get a little bit of gray or black spray paint and mist it and let it fall on them and then sprinkle those throughout and we could get ourselves a really cool looking brick scenario. So that may be the direction we head in all because I need to make the wall thicker just to put a wheel under it, just to get out underneath this corner. And uh, that's good because I hadn't thought about that cantilevering way out here until now. Well, you know, the thing is once I square it all up with Luan, it would hold that corner off the floor, but I hadn't even planned a wall. And at that point, then even if it was a little bit bendy out here and dipping down, there wouldn't be anything coming close to the ground to scrape. And of course, we've got enough counterweight in here that it isn't really a worry. And so it would just be in the physical strength. And in fact, I might even go from the upper corner inside down to the lower corner with a, with a uh, piece of two by four as a strut, as a gusset to fortify that all within the thickness here to fortify this outside corner back to the structure of the set. And so, you know, I really still think, I guess at the end of the day, since we have a half of an inch clearance out here visually, like at the rest of this is gonna have, Luan comes down to within a half an inch of the floor, but that's maintained by there being wheels. We're so far from wheels over here, being a half an inch off the floor physically and cruising around out here. This floor rolls up and down enough for us to find a few places where that scrubs the floor and gets hung up and ruins the momentum that stage crew has and otherwise causes problems. So putting a wheel under there to make sure that we stay off the floor and roll freely and smoothly if we're going to have any kind of a wall at all here, regardless of whether or not I thought I could truss this up and make it rigid enough, is going to be a best practice. Um, and I don't want to sit in the office or the house 
Uh, I certainly, I might not even get there. You know, if that, we ended up with that problem of it scrubbing, I'd have to dig into this thing as m being more finished and make it so where there's a wheel there. Whereas now's the time, I'm almost a bit further. Like, again, theoretically, I could have known that and planned it all and drawn the whole construction of this wall and have accommodated for that already. But there's no time like the present. I can always swing this out over the pit area or over the trap door and add wheels or change geometry and stuff now. So I'll do that now. And so just the sooner you're thinking about stuff, the better. And I'll also mention being able to roll over the hole in the floor if we take these posts down briefly. Because I'm going to end up probably putting wheels in the midpoint of this. Because I can see already that um, I had hoped to pull this up with this landing. But this is going to have too much bounce in it for a variety of reasons. And again, it may even scrub there. And that's all the more problem we have. But still scrubbing on the floor. It's noisy. It tears up the Luon. It's not professional. So I can see that this uh, plate needs to go. It has quite a bit of movement to it. So we'll probably roll this thing over this area. And I'll stick a couple more wheels on the bottom of it when I get some more harvested from old set where we left it from last year. So anyway, we've got things that we need to do now that we understand the physicality of it. And um, I'll pick this thing up again tomorrow, probably with that in mind. Let's we'll see how that turns out. All right, set fam. Students were able to, now that we're done with exam week, we got some burly boys and we dragged the old lower stairs from Adam's Family Musical up. And uh, of course these came together because again, we had a mirror image situation here. And when you swap those two things, uh, they came together here to make an extra wide central set of stairs that went left and right. And when you locked them together, you use these pole barn door latches. Same as uh, over here, we must have had the pole barn door latch hook, which this is going to work out nice because we got a stick right there, which is where we're going to want to mount the little loop that it uh, grabs. In fact, I may, I'll probably end up there, thereby, I'll end up with a two by four like this as well. So we have a really nice, well fortified. Um, against rotational forces and stuff, a situation there structurally. And then this ended up being, um, because I had the lock on the outside for the longest time, and then I realized, well, this has to be a completely smooth surface for the aforementioned arrangement where they come together. There can't be a lock or anything sticking out. So I ended up having to recess that latch, and this is how I did it here. So, And it was a bit of bit of messing around that I did later and did carefully and then put this blue on back on and like followed it with the trim router so it had essentially some really clean lines and stuff best case scenario there and um anyway a lot of that work has been saved in in the keeping of these rolling stairs which have been really useful in a lot of ways so we'll need some more geometry here again to get the lock installed and I'm going to try to remember to do that in the framing before I have to remove the skin all over again I'm going to go back and reference what it was that I built here exactly and uh, just see about that. So, however, I also, ooh, where did the drawings go? They were laying on the steps here. Oh, here they are. I did some more work in CAD this past weekend. Instead of coming out here, I was here Saturday at last. Today's Monday. Instead of coming yesterday on Sunday to work in real life, I got back into the CAD and made some modifications. I included the wall that we built and move the stairway etc into the situation that it's kind of going to try to be in i worked out a way then to leave ourselves enough inside corner in this area of the window so that could, that work for us and can stay central to that wall and the dormer window is a little bit narrower but it's all they're on the same center line which should ultimately look uh, the way that we need to now, i've brought my dimensions to build the dormer the rafters uh for the dormer the dormer gable end and the uh, full-size rafter and the gable dormer or the, or the raft. <laughs> the framing for the gable end of the dormer, a dormer rafter, and a rafter, you know, kings or whatever, a full size rafter, which will be everything to get us to this point. And, um, and then we can start looking at what that means. Now, before I had pulled this, I had the center line of the house way out here over this three or four steps down. And uh, then when I take the same rafter and mirror it over here, it hangs way out. Because I thought we might make another rolling door here and have some more components to crunch them all. But I think this is a, a place where we could nip that idea in the bud. See the rafter hanging well over here. And, you know, you can nip it back up there. And homes have that type of a roof angle. But it isn't as quaint 
and it has like a different aesthetic. And it's all essentially so that an adult, a six foot adult here, could still ostensibly walk up to this point, and then this starts to get narrower as more Matilda sized up there. And um, even though it's a bit awkward, that's the whole point here, see, because they basically shut her away in the attic. They've stuffed her up in there to forget about her. Now, in fact, I changed this and brought the center of the ridge over to the front of this first stair. And then we end up with a roof angle that is diminishes as you go up the stairs, but it's not even tall enough for a six per foot person here at the top of the landing, right? But the eave is the same geometry. You can put a short wall. I show a short wall there at the end, sitting on top of this landing like this. Right? And then we catch the bird's mouth just like we do over here on there. And I think in the end we end up with something that's more balanced, more finished looking. Now on the Crunchum Hall side, I don't really want to look at the back of this dormer and this roof line. So that I, may, if, I may actually take this back wall of the piece beyond the surface of the roof that we put here. And I don't even know that I'll put roof surface here so that you have to crouch to go up. Because we start to... I don't mind that. I don't mind it being you know something that we remember... If we have blocking that takes an adult from the Wormwoods up the stairs, they should have to duck their head because, it, again, it reminds us that she's in an uncomfortable little nook in the house, in an attic space, not a proper upstairs. However, the lighting is the thing. If it starts to be a surface that cuts out the lighting on characters up there, then we got a problem. It's certainly more material, and it'll certainly wait till the very end or a good deal longer before we decide on whether or not to go that route and put something there. However... On that surface, I could go up again with a framed upside down triangle wall and then make this side flat and smooth except for the little ridge kicking out. The thing about putting the ridge on the center line though is that would mean that this is more of a Western style facade with a big heavy crown mold across the top. And potentially that little ridge point could be translated down to create some kind of a diamond sigil feature, either architecturally or essentially just create a silhouette that's more acceptable for Crunchum Hall with a big sigil flag or whatever hanging in the central, you know, face of this wall and maybe a clock and some other stuff. I'd like to get maybe a phone on the wall with a cord and some other classroom type stuff here and uh, wainscoting or bit, bit judges panel. But then we have a logical uh, silhouette to both sides of this thing. We do have the overhang happening on the, on the um, Crunchum Hall side in that event, unless... You know, and this is where, if there was a little more time, I would just make a slide piece that you just shoop, shoop, pull out and it fixes that. In our case, we may be able to build something out so that from this side it does eclipse the overhang, and on this side it sticks out here, right? But basically, that's finished black. I really hate to do that for all the work and knowing the real geometry to get an eave and a soffit area and all this stuff to work out here and then put a wall behind it and paint it black. Really, uh, I'm loath to, to do that. Painting the tip of the rafter and whatever we end up doing for soffit and stuff like that black is a nice idea, but we often use the psych in the shows that we do here. And anyway, in a lot of ways you're backlit and then you end up with that silhouette, silhouette whether or not it's painted black. So these are some of the things that we've got to um, you know, look at. The other thing that I did is I came up with the height of the post. So if I get a 50 and 5 eighths post in there, and a 2 by 4 then I can put the ridge king in, and then I can make the rafters per this design sheet, and they ought to go up there and sit in the bird's mouth and go up and land on the king, and real quick today, be able to get this sort of thing started, and if I frame the gable end and put its ridge king on, then it's down to like a few rafters. And so I could get to a lot of what's shown up here today if... I'm content with it in general. Now we're going to lose some overhang if we add a layer of what looks to be a full-size brick facade on this house. And I like the idea of brick. It gives you that kind of UK salt box home kind of a feel. And this idea of the cross section here is a cool one. I've already built this wall out of two by four. And based on that, I've got the location of the bird's mouth. But as I stand here, I keep thinking that not only have we got to get the width wider to accommodate the wheel that we want to put underneath here, we're just going to end up framing it out and cladding it in Luan and painting it gray to be mortar. And then I'm going to make a sheet of styrofoam all textured up and then sliced up into little fake brick faces and then sprayed a deep, dark red uh, tone to begin with and then stick them all on with glue, leaving the mortar to show between them. And then we'll dry roll or dry brush a lighter red and catch the highlights and, and stuff like that on some of those bricks. And we'll maybe customize half a dozen of those or a dozen of those bricks, a little bit of splatter or whatever, so that when they're mixed in, there's a really cool aesthetic and it breaks it up further. 
but because I want to be out and essentially represent the mortar physically, um, I should have basically framed this on a two by eight. Uh, I want to look at what, and, and you know, now it's like, do you take it down? Do you remake it? Do you make another, do you put another wall on there? Well, no, two, three and a half inches is too wide for the mortar to stick the bricks to. So we got to make it out of smaller dimensional lumber than a two by four. And, but again, you get back to being seven and a quarter. If you're three and a half, four and a half, five and a half is a two by six. Two inches of mortar might, no, it's not going to quite cut the mustard. So then a two by eight is seven and a quarter. It's probably a little too heavy. I want to see this two by four on its end. So this framing will be set back so that the Luan comes in flush with it. And then the first thing we'll do is paint a big heavy black line to represent the gap between them that there should be. And this is for the one or two contractors in the audience that'll be like, hey, look at that thing. Looks like it cut a real house in half. Um, I may or may not show the black line. But anyway, I got to come up with what that dimension is and get that wrapped. And I think since we're up and roll, I mean, the thing is I'm going to operate here to put the wheel in this corner to support this thing. And that's what has me think. Oh, and I also want to let go of the framing with this door and move it over some because we decided that we're going to be at four inches back not more like 10 or whatever this inch, whatever this dimension is here, because that gets us inside here away from this window. And so if I'm going to let go of this rolling door, and I want to operate on this corner to put a wheel in here, and the thing isn't thick enough to begin with, the only thing that kills me is that I hadn't had this in the design when I did the lumber order, and so I ended up wanting these 2 by 4s to frame this out, but this is like 101 inches tall overall, so the 98-inch long stick to do a stud wouldn't come out of a 96-inch long uh, two by four, an 80 footer. So these ended up being the tens that I bought for Miss Honey's house slash Crunchum or Miss, what's her name? Uh, you know, her office. I wanted those, they go behind this desk. I haven't discussed this yet, but this desk has a 10 foot tall flat wall and the whole thing rolls around and has Honey's house on one side. And, uh, I forget her name. Beetle Brock's on the other side. But the point is I've consumed lumber that was intended for something else now. And... They're 120 as 10 footers, and then I cut it down to 98 because I needed two inches longer than an eight foot stick. So now if I pull them out of there and make that set piece, you know, there's, I could basically put the pieces that, I could make a little, another, another little short wall component to the top and put him on there and clad it all with Luan like we were going to anyway, and you'd never know. Um, but I have to do some blocking between the one and the other to keep it perfectly straight. It turns into a whole scenario, which sucks. Maybe that's what I'll do. I'll probably drop it, extend it either today or at another point to continue to be what I had planned for those two by fours. And then we might need to go and get half a dozen two by eights. I got to do the math, um, and reframe this correctly with accommodations for the with wheel in the corner, put it up again. The only problem with that is, is see this, whatever portion of two by eight shows before we start wrapping it in Luan, the Luan stands off of that toward us. And it just kind of makes it messy. This seam, I'd rather it set back and the brick was essentially, you know, because that's a good question. The brick wouldn't necessarily, I guess the brick would be cut through. So you'd have some brick ends that are perfect finished with grout and then you'd have some that had been apparently cut off now i have that hot wire foam knife and when we're all done i could leave that we could apply all the bricks leaving them long and then i could hot wire foam knife through everything and just touch up the ends that i cut and it would truly give that aesthetic of the ones that i set back and the end didn't quite get there they're finished with some mortar and the next one ostensibly kept going but it got cut off completely No, because they're not going to be full. The foam isn't going to be any more than a half of an inch thick. So this is going to be tricky, this area, to get it to look right. Practically no one will appreciate it. And we'll just discuss now and the several other times throughout this series what it takes to get this look done. Because it's kind of, kind of tricky to do it and make it right. So I haven't quite decided what to do here yet, but we better get to work on some of this stuff. I can make some rafters in the gable end to the dormer up there and continue to think, oh, that was the thing. So your dormer gable end is almost always completely flush with the exterior walls downstairs. They share, I mean, whether the roof comes out around it and goes back, if you look at this, that's something that I guess I was, you know, discussing this like everybody knows, but they may not. Your gable end wall for a dormer and the exterior wall and everything below it are all coplanar. 
So if I make this out of a wider dimension of lumber, then I would make the gable end of the dormer out of a wider edge of lumber too. It's more expensive lumber. It's taken apart stuff that I've already constructed. All to figure out what to do here. And this, I guess, all started in this little segment because I was talking about, I have basically what I'm comfortable with being a minimum overhang. I think it's about a foot from here to the front of the rafter. And you start adding three or four inches here and you start getting away from that looking as good. And then there's a question of whether we do it on this side of the house too. So in for a penny, in for a pound, and you want to be thinking thinking ahead. Uh, maybe I'll just keep thinking and start making some stuff I know that I can, but that's the thing. See, the bird's mouth location in the rafter is based on what we do here. Same with, well, no, the dormer rafter, but the dormer cable end, I don't know what dimension to make it out of either. And then if I'm making it out of wider lumber, I'm hanging it out into space too, because we've committed to this lower wall length and this um, landing length and everything. Mostly this rafter could be made, and just it's a matter of whether the bird's mouth gets another um, two, three, or whatever inches deeper in this regard. So from 16 inches back to whatever it ends up becoming there. So I suppose I can get 90% through the building of that stuff. But this is why, you know, it seems like you've done all the thinking you need to do. Um, but when there's plenty of time and plenty of money and you can do full and complete drawings and look at everything in 3D space and have a 3D model of the um, proscenium and all the stuff that I've yet to do after the many years of Working here, I haven't got a digital version of this stage to put things on with legs so you can see the sight lines and stuff. So we just sort of, um, this is where design build is forged. This is what makes me better and better at working like this in the residential sector to make important decisions. Uh, we will do what we can with this today to stay productive and we'll continue to suss out what directions we will take and avoid as much rework as humanly possible, but essentially design in the field and make it as productive as we can because uh, we've got uh, the ability to make and the ability to think and plan all in the one brain. Isn't that cool? All right. All right, I want to make a point here and show how this might be what some people would think is all that's necessary. It's certainly where my head began here because there's a lot of moving pieces with finishing this and making it look right. But as you can probably tell now that I've done this, we haven't got a great deal. Give me back my son. There. We haven't got a great deal of structural integrity there. We're still plowing into the floor, right? We're still twisting this. Oh, that wasn't actually attached. I forgot just the little tips of the lag. But more importantly, it's quite obvious that that is a really weak connection. And the other thing here is that I came down to within a half an inch of the floor with this lower plate because I wanted to carry the surface of the Luan down there. It basically just wasn't thinking here, see? Because you get all done, this lower plate should just go all the way across the way the old one did, but just high enough for wheels to go underneath it, which is what we do in every other case, and we hang just the Luan down, see? Even in the case of this stair, we go around the other side, it's just the Luan hanging down. That way you don't actually get stuck on anything on the floor because we've got actually, we've actually got plenty of, sorry, we've got plenty of clearance, truly. Um, it's hard to see, but you remember when I had this uh, stairway flipped up, we know that it's just Luan here. And then if you clear a little bump or scrape over it, that's why these are kind of flipped up half an inch is a bit close for other stages. We didn't have this trouble at all here on this stage, but when we loan these out, that's what we ended up with. So, but as soon as you clear that little pinch point that's pretty frail, then you've got clearance again 
bringing the framing of that wall down to where it's a three and a half inch wide two by four that's structural gliding along around on the floor you're looking for a place to get stuck even this area underneath the feet of this rolling doorway it's only half an inch or three quarters of an inch or so and then it's a hollow cavity with a caster wheel and so you end up we've pulled like a feather boa or something else you know string sometimes gets caught in there or whatever however it's immediately relieved and you have mobility still and in the middle of a show you want to be permanently stuck here we're going to turn the house lights on close the curtains and i'll have to run out of the audience and come up and rescue us and like knock on wood we've never had any kind of a major show debacle by then we've shaken everything out so long story short it should probably be all those studs should be cut up that high and uh now that i've cut the bottom plate i can't reuse that and once I cut them up that high, they didn't need to be made out of a 10 foot piece of lumber to start with. It could have been eight feet. And so this is where we want to get a handle on it and stop the bleeding on productivity here. Um, I'm going to finish cutting those and make a new plate and attach it to the bottom of there. And then we'll just hang the luon down. And uh, the last part of this is that, you know, like I said, this plywood wasn't attached, but the load center of this wheel is in the middle of that circle base. And that ends up outside the footprint of this load bearing situation. And so these are, this wheel out here will be always trying to tip up. Once I get that plate on there and the plywood there with the wheel on it, what I'm saying is I'll probably end up taking an angled gusset at a sharp angle and going up to the wall on both corners of that plywood to truly brace it all in, up there. And then what we come back and do for framing to carry the fake mortar, we'll have to eclipse that somehow which we ought to be able to make happen but it is a consideration simply adding a framing system outside of this doesn't translate the load from inside to the outside and down we've got to take uh, the outside over the wheel back over and under what's loaded here for weight so that may or may not make sense but we've got a bit of a fiddle fuck with this corner on account of what we're doing here and the way that we're going about it so this is what you get sometimes you make a lot up working in the field but you can lose a little bit here we're going to remake some stuff we're going to need four new two by ten or two by four by ten feet the moment i cut those we were committed to that anyway but i just didn't quite know what we wanted for a set this year until we got out here to start working so all right now that i'm this far we'll do what i was talking about there and just keep moving <laughs>
All right, I added a stick here so that we can attach to this door and another one here so that I can run down to this plywood with a matching gusset. I'll just take him off quick and copy him and throw another one on there. Then we'll have this outside loaded out the way that it should be. Now that I'm really starting to see this thing racking over to the right, which makes me want to skin this end. Uh, yeah, that's going to be something that we're going to want to do. The rest of the interior box of this other set piece can get some two by four sticks running around. Now I want to be able to get in there and do the magic chalkboard. So when we built this for Adams, I had some three dimensional sticks trussing this out to square, which we got to be careful of now because of we want, you know, we want interior space. Normally I would go across the back side of these at an angle once it's perfectly uh, true and do the same on the other side, but in the opposite angle and on the ends. But doing it on this side, like I said, we're going to have mostly a big opening here that we have to magic chalk through it. And so it'll probably be the one wall that doesn't end up being trussed that way, just with the skin on it. And in the case of this wall, it's not thick enough. <clears throat> We've got a big window hole in the middle of it. So it will be the plywood on this outside. It will be the Luan on this outside that holds it square. So sooner the better with that. Um, I'm going to leave the window opening this size because I can throw that grid in at worst case, but if I end up having a few minutes, I'd like to build it so that it looks like a double hung sash. Um, I can't go down below these gussets then with that sheet of plywood, but it won't be necessary to. Man, I'd really like to. I'll take that gusset off and trace him, but before I put the two back on, we'll use m most of a full sheet here. That way I've got all this registration underneath the window hole to help hold this square. And then it won't hurt to put those back on. In fact, I can take another quarter inch off the face of them like I did before, just to keep this corner down here. Um, it's actually a little bit proud right now. So I could take a little like 5 16 or almost 3 8 off of this surface of these when I make another one. And then I put the Luan on this whole wall and then put those gussets back. Use the Luan. I'll attach the Luan, you'll notice when I do it. I'll stick it across the top flush. And then the side will hang down. And likely because this thing is racked that way, it'll expose. And then we'll just rack it until that straight factory side lines up with this. And then we'll tack it down there. And then we'll proceed to find some more framing here to hold it all flat. And then I'll just plunge and router out this window hole. And like that, we'll have structural integrity. And we'll have it skinned for the most part. Um, actually, it won't be a... Um, we're going to build facade beyond that. So it won't be anything visual. But we'll have that racking controlled, which will help us keep this dangling ass leg that comes down to the floor and has wheels and goes up and over this and keep it from twisting around out here or relating weirdness to this thing as we roll around on the floor. That's gonna be important. And we can't put plywood on the inside because this was built just line to line big enough to accommodate this rolling doorway. So the plywood that goes on these surfaces will just come up and stop, which will be kind of fiddly to do but it's just one of those things. We're in it too far now to plan on that plywood thickness. Oh well. All right, I need the six foot step ladder to get that done and I don't know where it went. So we're gonna wait until we find that out. For right now, I need a ceiling in here to carry the surface. I need a framing in here to carry the ceiling surface. And also, we've got a problem here where once we're inside of the three and a half inches, anything beyond that and the, and the set is sitting down then over, and there's basically nothing to get a hold of here. And so if I were to put the ceiling in, then that'll carry the surface from this piece of framing flush right across to this piece here. And there we can go. I mean, it's still gonna be you know jostled around in there, but the set won't be able to fall down over this door and that'll help with door installation. And it's something I could build right now. So now I need a 40 by 50 and three quarter frame with a couple sticks in it to hold the Luan up. And I could put that up in there. And I could also get the um, landing up there because I forget that starting this plywood at the top of this framing, I could actually put the landing on and I could start the plywood across the top of that landing. And thereby less of it would have to be cut off or just more of it could hang down, I suppose. I can't get to this bottom plate. No, I can. This is now shorter than eight feet. So it actually still will be worth, yeah, it'll be worth adding that up just to there, but not going up over the face of that um, landing because then I'll get away from being able to go across the bottom edge and get that reference point. As soon as you only have a couple of screws into these studs, that 
sheet can wiggle and stuff. And even though it's inside the wall, I want the structural integrity of being able to go down the side of this and this and the edge of there and control them for square. That controls this wall. So I won't necessarily need the landing up before I put this plywood on. The bird's mouth is sized to sit tight to the landing, not out onto this luon. So then we won't have trouble at the top when we add the thickness of luon in the bird's mouth or have to notch around and everything. So this will make things kind of easy peasy when I can get to it. I don't have a step ladder right now though. So I'll make the ceiling and throw that in. <laughs>
Well, that's a big set. But everybody kind of likes a big set, no? It's tall. It's definitely reaching for the sky. I put the gable end on for the dormer just to get a sense of where that comes in. We're at about 13 feet right now. And so you got about a six inches roughly to the ridge of the dormer on account of the rafter. And then you got another six inches above that for the actual peak of the house. Um, if we're gonna put her in that window and she's gonna uh, face the audience, we're gonna have to truly turn this thing straight forward and roll it down, which will probably take some people, some crew inside which is a cool idea I've had for a long time and I've wanted to employ as a, a set that... See ya. Sorry. No, you're cool. See you tomorrow. If it moves of its own accord, like almost like we had, as if we had a turntable or some other kind of subtly controlled mechanical set, but we've got manpower or child power. So we're flirting with that idea. I gotta get the subfloor onto the upper um, landing or the attic floor or whatever before I can put the dormer up permanently. And then I've got, I may as well put the subfloor on that landing there. That's the landing, that's the attic floor in this case of this construction. <coughs> oh, big development. We've decided not to go with, as of now, the Crunchum Hall classroom isn't what we're gonna put on this side of the set. I think we're gonna put the library on this side of the set because I was gonna do the blackboard on this but they would like that to be way downstage and up cl close and personal to the audience for that effect. And bringing this monstrosity down will sort of block everything else off. And so I think that they would like a classic rolling blackboard with some other kind of provisions where we can hide someone behind it to do that effect. Uh, I think that there's some trouble with that too, some problems with that. So we're gonna continue to sort of figure out what's gonna make the most sense with it. But for now, we may pursue the library on the other side. So tomorrow, I'll get those surfaces on, maybe make those stair stringers, put uh, the dormer kind of up and some rafters in position. You know, the thing about the rafter, excuse me, is that, uh, where's my images? Here they are. Currently, right before I came down here, the last iteration had this coming out and landing. That's wrong. I should get some of these incorrect ones out of here. The last iteration had it, unlike this, where it's way out to mirror this one is way out in space on the right. We may I made it so that it worked out sitting on this wall, right? Just as it sits out here. However, it's kind of tough to describe, but if these stairs go up against the inside wall of the house, the framing wouldn't actually sit in there. It would be to the outside. It would be stuck to this face and be greater than this face. So there'd be a full wall thickness on this side before the rafter landed. And then there'd be the same like brick on this side as there is on the other. And we get into, you know, what, what do, what do we do about that? And so, you know, because even if I were to apply brick here, I would take it down there and then the stairs are just sort of finished or unfinished. It's just, it's kind of tough what to do the way that we figured out what to do over here. And that may or may not move the bird's mouth, which may or may not change the geometry of the rafter, which would change this rafter's geometry. So I'm going to continue to hold off on the rafter until I have, uh, and these are just little things that probably not a lot of people will realize necessarily, but it's basically thinking that should happen now so that f future finishing steps go right along without becoming tricky and right now it would be tricky because i don't you know you can always just paint stuff and call it done but i wouldn't know what to paint on the surface over here this side of that lower stair that's finished is just a smooth brown we could do that over here um i'm not sure we need anything on there other than a muted tone in the end because I, I don't know whether we're going to keep this normal or at 90 degrees to the house or if we're going to do a little bit of an angle a little bit of an angle once you start doing a little bit of an angle then you start seeing these sides and just being being dark, dark brown is a step in the right direction but it doesn't hurt to put a finish on them even if it's something mundane like brick 
it's still visually interesting and it helps you to understand where you are. And each of these um, things that may, we may investigate and do becomes something that we've got in our back pocket. Even if it's just all the little bricks that we would make for this show, we've got those that surface laying around or that technique in our back pocket for some time when it's more important that we have brick as the star of the show or something like that. And I'm also challenging myself to, here because, you know, this is one half essentially of a set that was built for a previous show. There's some things that are different about it and we don't have all the time in the world, but I like a challenge. And so to keep things fresh, I'm bothering to make this much more uh, work for myself, but it won't hurt to have in my portfolio a uh, physical construction that's, <laughs> you know, that showcases the real way that the wall cross section is put together that may serve me well in the future things like that um, where I bothered to do something and then was asked to do that exact thing officially well hey I've got a picture of that in my portfolio you know where I went and did something along the lines of that so all all things all things considered we're going to continue to pursue that and hold off on that rafter geometry until we're sure and just let this idea of the library on the other side roll around in our heads for tonight I think some cool ideas will come to me um, we've got these books that we built for Beauty and the Beast, these bookshelves. They are a little worse for wear, but we rolled up our lovely Carla art direction. Uh, she rolled up all this fabric and hot glued it and wrote on the binding. And the only issue was that you really, this whole space should be a dark color, practically black like this, this whole space, um, to give it depth. This here is far too light. This is a bit of a shadow underneath the shelf, kind of, but it just ends up being, it doesn't play as nicely as if it was a real dark color like that. And so I was hoping to mix up something like that and have somebody paint these. The thing is, you got to paint around all the books now, and it's just, we'll see how far we get. We may make no progress on that. And then once you've done that, then I'd like to make something like this Luan, but, you know, probably made out of one by, but go down with some real styles, like cupboard face frame styles, uh, at the very least, if not right over top of this quarter round that was used to create a shelf and just just bulk that up just a little bit more give it a little bit more dimension and we might put one right on the set or two and then fly the third one in i think we have three we may even have four we have extra books that's for sure so we may use one and then illustrate some more shelves in the same style and put the extra books that never found a home up onto the set and then fly the two other shelves in kind of on a bar adjacent to the set piece for that scene so various ideas Still in early stages. I would resist putting that sheet down with more than the two screws I used until we've taken a lot of the jello out of this whole thing. Now it's moving a little on the floor, yeah, but the rigidity on this end as a result of the skin is far greater than over here. And uh, you know, because to start with, you start thinking about, well, I can go up there and stand now. And you really want to tighten this up a lot more than it currently has been. And again, we still haven't got those extra wheels underneath here. We just got a lot of jello here. See when I do that? I don't 
know if it plays on the on the video, but yeah, she's got a lot of jello in it. Now the stringer's being in there rigidly attached to this, because this thing being in a horizontal flat aspect and that in the horizontal flat aspect can bow a lot easier than if you were to roll them up on their edge just as a two by four. So when you come in here with a stringer made out of a two by 12 and attach it to there, then you turn this whole thing into what amounts to an L channel. Uh, you make a you know angle iron, essentially, to strengthen that. Uh, sort of same as, same uh, uh, situation with that. And you take a lot of that bounce out, right? However, I want to square this up but with sheets before I go fortifying it and committing to those things. I've already committed to these rigid vertical members attached to these horizontal members, but that was a factor of them being the right size and being flush. So you can get away with that to a certain extent. But then you start wanting to lock this thing up and stop it from racking with a skin before you go putting all of the heavy duty structural stuff in and committing to it because then what I'm saying is later you come back to skin it and you want to move it around to accommodate the square pieces so that you're sure you're squaring it out. And all of the construction above and rigidity that you added before it was square is fighting you, okay? So I guess right now we're gonna stop. In fact, it wouldn't hurt to you know, skin things as you go. Uh, the other thing here is that I'm gonna continue this wall beyond the stairs. We're gonna start right on this landing in the uh, attic and frame more wall. And on this backside, it's gonna be called planar with all of this framing. And it's gonna be skinned right along like that. So I'm only gonna put one horizontal course on here because I wanna get the stairs and that much more wall and come back with a full sheet and put another horizontal course of full sheets on. There's no use in trying to make up the last little bit here or leaving a big sheet to wangle around for a few days before I get to the point where I've built all of that and it keeping me from being able to get on this side and build. So we'll just get one full course of horizontal sheets on both big long sides, probably. We'll save the end because I gotta get it to latch to that other stairs like we were talking about. So let's put two full sheets on here and see if a third one can't be cut to make a, the rest of the piece that's necessary for both of the two sides. Thereby we may go right from one end, right on through to here and consume three sheets or mostly. Anyway, too much talk, not enough. Okay, the truth is that that lower stick being bouncy because we haven't got a wheel under it there is gonna be a problem. We don't wanna commit and screw into that or hope to lift it later and put a wheel under it and take this whole thing up to where it's teetering to some degree or preloading whatever flexibility we have because that's a low lying point. We need to get that wheel under there before we can even put a skin on. And I think that I'm out of wheels. Uh, no, I take that back, I have a few. So I guess we're gonna roll this thing over the opening in the, the trap door. We'll take these posts down. I'll maneuver this thing around and roll over there. And then I'm gonna have to put in a cross member and then jump it down. I'll probably go from top to top and then add a piece that just fits inside. So the bottom surface is coplanar with the bottom surface of these. And then I can add probably a square or something, a three quarter inch plywood, just enough to accommodate the elevation change with this that I use with these triangles or have with those triangles. And then stick, I'll probably put the wheel right on the plywood first and get up and running like that. Then we can come right back here where we were and put this skin on. You'll notice the B side is going in with the knot holes. There's a football fill for you or a similar type of a fill. There's another few. That's where they got real bad. And this is why, I, or this is where they're not so bad, but I don't even know why they're bothering with a fill. Oh, you know why? Because this is underlayment. So they physically want that to be supported. So despite the fact that this side is the beauty side up, you don't want a void that ends up getting stepped on over and over again underneath the finished floor. And then you end up with a crack in your click together uh, floating floor, or you end up with a crack in your linoleum that ends up collecting dirt and then it won't go away, won't come clean. All because the missing material in a bad knot is of a certain size. Now these have actually missing like that size. They probably have a half inch or a three quarter of an inch or whatever diameter. The little finger bar, maybe when this is coming through the machine, it's got a bunch of different little fingers. And if it drops into a void for a longer period than one inch or whatever, if it's down there for anything over the diameter of an inch, that switch tells uh, the machine to make a repair there. I'm just imagining how the thing works, but you can't be selling underlayment that has voids in it and then it's wrecking people's flooring. And if you got a good contractor, he won't even put it down. But the point is we're gonna put the nice side out because that paints nicely. But uh, again, we can't do this till we get the wheels under there, so let's get that done.
Okay, it's super nice to have basically this service trench or whatever you want to call it to, for things like this. I've needed this before. I needed to make, before we went in on these Rose brand casters, which I highly, highly recommend. These are pro grade, heavy duty. When we built the set for Beauty and the Beast and put students on top of it for a choreographed battle and we use the Rose brand brakes and the whole system. But to start with, you're loading the axles of these you know, if whatever this weighs, plus kids and everything, we've got, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven axles and uh, their load bearing capacity, you know, which is great. Now, the other thing that, um, and so in the, in the past, we had hardware store casters where the overmolded rubber skin came off when we were zipping around for rehearsal. Now, if that had happened during the show, we'd have been up shit crick, but... I was able to, instead of tipping something over like this, when it's got, uh, you know, you notice I tip this thing up as early as possible so we're not dealing with all the weight of it that we add and trying to tip it over again when you're washing out with wheels underneath it to make a, do a service repair basically is a big pain. And you can cantilever off the front of the stage and do some things, but uh, we couldn't get off of that far enough to do anything here in the middle of this set piece without it just, cra you know, crashing right off on the floor of the house. So this is a really nice feature to have. And over here is where I wanted to show you you can see that wheel. This is how much, you know, the stack up here of this wheel and the plywood is the same as over there, but that's how much of a belly's in this wall. So I'm gonna crash into the stage over there and you see it, see that? Pick us up and the same goes over here. Oh, I'm pushing my can, but even on this side, there'll still be collateral. Hang on, get there. I'm gonna want, there it is. Go right up on top of it. Now we've got, We've divided the distance from load-bearing points in half here. We've got a far straighter, more well-supported wall system as a result, because this is all a finite length. And so that's been taken up. Uh, it's doubled the quality of the level, doubled the quality of the straightness. Levels subjective to the surface that we're rolling on. But the straightness of this component with all this load on it and this weird, you know, dynamically, you know, loaded component is now twice as straight as it was as a result of having the distance over which it's being asked to span with the same sort of loads. So hopefully that makes sense. I use the steel weights for the rope weights to stop some of these things from rolling away from me sometimes too, you know, as we back it up. So when I'm doing something, I don't want it to run, run away from me. Now we got what we want. We can slide our half inch plywood back underneath there and skin, put one course of plywood on the one side, then the other and uh, go back about our business. Let's get the safety guards back up around this opening right away and drop them on the floor and then shut this off so I can use two hands. Well, you notice that the end of my sheet didn't work out on the stud because my layout actually starts here, which is the nature of this small cavity between the last second last stud and the last stud. So this needs to be taken apart and we need to send the sheet to this end. I had been thinking that I would do it opposite on both sides and make up the piece opposite, but it wasn't framed opposite. It was framed as a mirror image and they're both sheets are gonna wanna start at this door alcove opening or whatever and go this way and the small piece is left to make it up on the other side. So it's part of having your head in the game and uh, nothing that won't take a minute or two here, but once we're on the right track, we wanna stay on the right track. Okay, another thing you want to remember, because this stud, all these are on a 16 inch on center layout, and this one works out like that, and of course the other one works out like that too. However, I had started on one of these to frame from this way, and then I changed it and came back. Now this one, I didn't fix this stud or this stud, because layout, as according to this and through here, should be here, and where's my other mark? Here. So these two need to move over. I can unscrew them at the top, but below I'm gonna to have to sneak them back over that opening to move them. And over here I got it right, and I think what I did was I probably just skipped, no, the second one, the last one is, is here. It is a weird little gap. But this is layout, and then we need one more little piece. 
Uh, well, we won't because we're going to stop in the middle of this one and then we'll make a piece from here to the center of there. That's another consideration when you hang drywall and stuff because you're going to use trim. You can start back three quarters of an inch and you end up obscuring that. But I want this to be a nice, what looks like finished outside drywall corner. So a full eight foot sheet is going to work out, bam, right on top of, sorry, where the stud should be. It'll fully eclipse it, and then the next sheet won't have anything to grab. Sorry. On this side, it won't have anything. So, we either cut the sheet three quarters of an inch short before we put too many more screws in it. That's probably what we should do. I don't like getting so close to the edge of the of the Luan because when, in a drywall situation, we putty and finish all of that, but all of the split and sitting up grains and everything here that we try to do when we pin two on the same. A nice thing to do if I'm gonna take this out and move it is to just turn it flat in anticipation of having plenty of room to get well into the sheet on both sides and get, stay away from the edge. So that's probably what I'll do. I'll turn him flat and put the center line right on the layout. So if this is where the stud was supposed to go, I'll turn the two by four flat and I'll put it center here, putting whatever, uh, one and three quarters, one and three quarters there. It'll sit in there. I'll do the same thing on the other side while I'm at it. And then when we come back on the upper, we could choose to use a full sheet, although I don't think it'll work. I don't wanna go too far down that rabbit hole of anticipating that and turning studs. Certainly can't turn any that have an angle on the top of them, but we could add a scab block to the side of it just to make it easy to put sheets on. Anyway, more to this than I was thinking, but let's just go ahead and get through it and keep moving. Another thing that sucks is that we've got the short drywall screws that belong to the school organized into this container. And that amounts to inch long, inch and a quarter. There's some inch and five eighths in here. Uh, there's fine thread of all different lengths. Uh, there's a two inch, you know, That's, in a professional world, you don't want to have, and you know, randos, obviously, it's actually better when you can pick stuff up that's obvious to the eye. But really, I would just like one inch, I'd like coarse thread overall. I don't, I don't have a use in the world for fine thread. And um, coarse, and either inch or inch and a quarters. Inch and five eighths is too long to be putting drywall up with. And uh, obviously, any longer is far even worse than that. So before I clean this up, I might organize out just what I want is inch and inch and a quarter and then keep moving here too. So all just takes time. So I could have sworn we kept the stringers. See, we kept the lower portion of the Adams Family set fully assembled there in that small stair. 
but this component was taken apart, both of them, but the upper stringers here, we would have kept. There's no reason we would have thrown them away. They did come to a point because the first step goes up from here because this here is a step. So the bottom had a point, and so I thought, well, if anybody needs them in the future for a situation, they could cut it flat, and they would be able to set flat on the floor. And I cannot for the life of me find the stringers. I can't find the ones that point. And every set of stairs is a little bit different. We did find these two different stringers from previous sets, from previous years. There's a good chance because I like to use dimensional lumber and not have to rip it up. So I like a rise that just fits a two by eight at seven and a quarter. However, you can do that and change the stair angle, which is what must be the case between these two stringers. These are from two different sets of stairs. So when I come in here and make this flush, this is out, this is out more, this is out even more and more, and we're pretty close at the back. So they're obviously from two different sets of stairs. Obviously one's longer, one's shorter. Now this is the one I was using to mock up though, earlier in this process, and then it fell and broke and the other piece broke. I think that's right here. But the deal, the thing is, I have what I need in this shorter stringer. If I just cut this straight, I go back to having a point, and it practically works out exactly. And the thing is, this one's already damaged. So I am going to cut this and set it up there and see what the major problem may be. There may be an unequal step situation, slightly shorter or slightly taller from one or to the other landing. Uh, but in the scheme of things, Using these up is going to save me a lot of time. I can always throw them in there and uh, use them for a little bit and while we rough this thing out. And if it really becomes a problem, I can quickly make a new fresh set that's exactly right. But this here is really damn close. So I'm going to square that off. That's what you'll see me do here, not make a new set of stringers from scratch, unfortunately. Fortunately, they may work for us, but unfortunately, this series won't show me making stringers. But I've done it before on set projects and normal projects. Here's the other one. But... Um, let me operate on the one that's been damaged, and then if it's going to work for us, I can glue the component that broke back on with some construction adhesive. And then, uh, if I like that, I'll make the I'll modify the other one, and then we'll just keep moving. Well, it's damn close, but it's not going to work. Um, you got to remember that you're going to add an inch and a half for a step on this first one to start with. Meaning you're here and then it's an awfully tall stair, even after a landing surface of material, which won't be inch and a half. And then at the top, by the time you add this thickness to that step on top, you're obviously wildly too high. So it's just makes a good example of how different stairs, even this angle is that little bit of gap is a factor of this uh, piece being a little bit bowed, which is probably a result of putting that uh, wheel underneath the center of that. And, you know, in the best case scenario, you'd unbutton these two studs, maybe three of them and marry that uh, upper plate of that wall to the stringer that fits correctly and then put those back thereby their gap would go away. But, Again, the angle's correct, so the surface of the stair is level. It's just not the right split, it's not the right division in the rise to that point. So we better go back to planning on making a custom stringer, so I guess you get to watch me, but it won't be today because I haven't got the CAD drawing printed out. I'm gonna put a, cut a piece for a surface on top of that landing so that the two landings have something, and then uh, we'll see where we're at. All right, before I head down to work for the day, I'm back in front of the computer so I can show where I'm thinking now. And uh, again, the framing for this end wall is coplanar to the end of the floor system for the attic area, which is coplanar to the gable uh, wall for the dormer. And that's because they're all the exterior side walls of a house. So that's where they're kind of at. Um, 
the brick facade that I build in here is going to come up, and then it doesn't even need to be fit around the, as soon as we pass the plane at the bottom edge of the rafter tip, um, that'll have what appears to be a soffit or whatever, or at least it'll go up and out of sight. And then once the deck of the roof comes through about here, then we can start the brick again and go right on up the front here, which is what you would do normally, which is what will look correct to, like I say, the one or one and a half people in the audience that appreciate that. And then moving the end wall off of the landing so that the matrix can take over. Um, moving the, this end wall off that landing right by his foot and putting a full you know, layer on the outside means that it will make more visual sense that the stairs come over and stop at this plane rather than stopping somehow inside the exterior wall of the house, which again, most people would just miss that. Um, I'm going to put this, the same sort of brick, I think, facade on this end and go up to there with it. Um, and I think, you know, to be in the house, you're basically, your, your eye line's a little lower than that. It's almost the same with the stage at this distance or whatever. But we've got action uh, in the house anywhere from here. And I'd like to have people in there and lazily move the set back and forth like this slowly to feature Matilda in her upstairs window or in the bathroom, dyeing the hair, and then, you know, be able to come back like that and sort of have that flexibility. And then, of course, turn this all the way around. And I think we're going to park it onto stage left and tuck, and that would mean that, you know, as well, I'm going to actually move us in here. That would mean that the matrix, but that would mean that the um, main curtain, or even if we back it off and it's behind one of the legs back there, that this rafter tip and the gable end, if we don't come all the way out, it would be easier to turn this into the library, downplaying this rafter tip, especially if we play it, paint it black. And I expect this facade to come up and come through just underneath the tip of the roof and obscure, essentially the same elevation as the ridge of the dormer so you won't see that but there'll be a little tip thing here that again if i play that up it will really stand out and it'll kind of make for a nice municipal kind of a facade not that we're outside of the library but it'll have the trappings architecturally of the inside of a more grand and municipal space like a library um you know and obscure the fact that it's the other side of this house piece uh, this door being recessed a little bit, if I trim outside of that, will turn that step into just more trim, which will help this because there's a lot of wall here. All of a sudden, there'll be a lot of wall. We're going to want probably a full bookcase on it. Or we've got the uh, circulation desk or something like right in front of it there, and that ought to help out. And for these dreamy sequences or the storytelling sequences that happen adjacent to the set piece, um, there's a lot going on with the set piece, hopefully, to 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 unify and and bolster those scenes because of course we're in the uh, circus and there's that stuff going on with the projection but I just I'd be loath to have nothing on stage but the projection going for the storytelling um, and we were going to bring in the bookshelves on a bar and stuff that was going to be something but I think I'm happier with this is it too bad that Crunchum Hall, I think what we're going to do, because I haven't mentioned them, but there's some rolling, um, they were jail wall on wheels for Chicago a couple years ago. But we're going to use them in the beginning for hospital partition, one side, and then they've got some bright colors for that musical number that are sort of, um, you know, uh, abstract, just big color panels flying around for that musical number. But then I think after that is over at the beginning of the show, we can slide some kind of thin Luan box or some such type thing onto them or apply Luan to the one face of them that's finished with some municipal blocking and some other sort of typical, uh, like a drinking fountain or something like that maybe, and roll them across the back or in a semicircle or in a pair of angled insides or whatever and basically be in Crunchum Hall with those. And, um, and that ought to work well. And then we got to be outside on the playground area, which I think we're going to bring some trees in from Shrek to be outside at Crunchum. And we got the Crunchum Gate that we've got to do too that'll be kind of outside. And thereby the biggest, grandest space will have the least amount of set pieces, but thereby it will be more all-encompassing hopefully. So we'll see if I'm able to pull that off. That's the idea here. <laughs> 